going to let everybody in. Well, good evening, everybody. I'm Phil Stasek with the Space Coast Progressive Alliance. I'm the past president, and I would like to welcome all of you that are joining us tonight on our Zoom uh, first Thursday event. And we'll be also, we are streaming live on Facebook. And by the way, it is recorded, uh, our, our Facebook stream, so that uh, at a later time, uh, if you want to, or you have friends that miss it, uh, they can come back to our uh, Facebook feed and, and watch our recorded live uh, stream. It is a terrific honor tonight to be welcoming uh, another very important group here in Brevard County in the Space Coast, uh, Families for Safe Schools. They were a, a not-for-profit organization who has been standing up for a number of different things. They're going to tell us all about it tonight, but frankly, for safety, for our students, our staff, our teachers, our school board members, uh, promoting civil discourse in our community. Uh, they've been doing a lot of really wonderful things, and, and we really wanted to give them uh, a platform to talk about their organization, probably uh, to inform you a little bit about what's been going on. Uh, I suspect they may be talking a little bit about pending legislation and all that sort of thing. Uh, it's going to be a great night tonight. Um, one of the things that we always do at our events is we encourage uh, civil discourse. That is to say, um, you know, if you're angry and you really want to yell at somebody, this is not the night for you to be here. We want people uh, who can ask intelligent questions, who, who can, uh, you know, improve the quality of our discussion, um, have a civil discourse. We believe that that is uh, the key to success for our community. In fact, you know, for the, for the year 2022, the Space Coast Progressive Alliance is going to try to have a number of different events, and we'll be focusing on the idea of civil discourse. So we encourage you to be involved. We encourage you to, to ask good questions, make great comments, uh, and, and do it in a civil and open and, uh, let's call it, friendly way. We can all respect each other, even if we disagree, right? Um, so for this evening, uh, we, uh, I, again, I am a past president, and what I would like to do is to hand the floor over to our current president, Raed al Shaibi. So Raed, would you like to uh, take the floor? Thank you, Phil. Yes, uh, and uh, thank you for, uh, of course, uh, doing a marvelous job at hosting these uh, monthly events. So I want to welcome everyone to our uh, monthly events at uh, Space Coast Progressive Alliance. We uh, do have these events on the first Thursday of every month. And uh, we're proud to say that uh, we're starting here with, with great programs. Uh, we had 11 programs, 11 monthly programs last year. We learned a lot and we're hoping that we can push this year and, and produce more education and more in engagement with, uh, with our community. Uh, you know, doing this work requires a lot of work, a lot of volunteer times. And I just wanna, you know, you just send, send a quick message to our board and our action project committee. These are great groups of people who volunteered their time to put these programs and, and produce uh, an opportunity for everybody to share uh, events that are happening that we can learn and we can coexist and we can grow and we can benefit uh, in, in energy, in environment, and in, you know, social uh, you know, discourse. And sometimes we, we try not to get into politics, but sometimes you know, we have to educate each other and, and learn so, but the, the the action project committee and I just want to say that this year we're going to try to do it on a monthly basis as much as we can. But definitely we'll have a quarterly program. But we 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 thought we're going to start in March, but we did one in January. We're doing one in February, and I, I just want to my hats to 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 Vicky Impoco. Vicky Impoco, of course, uh, mm -hmm. uh, great board member has been with us, been an ex president president of this of this organization, and she just said that this is a great group that are gonna bring a lot of information to an important subject these days. So I just wanna thank Vicky and thank you for the group for accepting to be with us today. Of course, you know, we, we can't survive and we can't continue to, to, to do this work unless we have the support of members and people joining us. Uh, so I just wanna encourage everyone today is, you know, you can visit us at uh, www.scpaflorida.com and you can join us, it's only $25 uh, per person or thirty-five dollars per family for the year, and uh, I'm sure I'll, uh, if, if Carol with us is, is Carol with us, she can jump in and just maybe push for a little bit of those. Maybe we can have more more information on our membership. Is she on with us, Carol or Barbara? 
They're on. If not, they are on. Right. Okay. If oh, give her a couple of seconds. Carol can just you know pitch in on 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 uh, uh, joining us. Uh, otherwise, finally. Uh, okay. Yeah, I'm unmuted. <laughs> yeah, just what you said, Raid. Um, 25 for individuals, 35 for families. You can also mail a check. If you go to the scpaflorida.com website, it has the address, PO Box 412, Melbourne, Florida, 32902. Uh, we'd welcome to have anybody join our group and uh, please do. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, we appreciate you and uh, all the work that you do. And uh, you know, there, there's, uh, as Phil said at the beginning, it's important to, when we listen to these, to these uh, discussions that we have an action plan at the end of it and we you know share this information and push it so we would i'm looking forward to listening to our you know group to, tonight and see what they recommend and hopefully we can help uh, spread uh, the information correctly to, to everyone um there's some serious also bills that we're working through the florida state legislator uh, legislators uh, so we we want you to watch scp action alert emails that will be sent in the in the next uh, week or so. And action is important, as I said. Uh, and uh, I think Phil uh, might have also a few more information about some local uh, politicians that are running. We invite everyone, if anybody wants to, to share any of their information and uh, tonight. Uh, Phil, do we have anybody with us today? Yeah, in just a second, Phil's gonna come off of mute here in just a second. Oh, thank um, you very much for reminding me. I appreciate it. <laughs> By the way, for those of you that are wondering, that's uh, Daniel McDowell. And he is, of course, a uh, representative uh, in West Melbourne. Uh, and I, what I'm looking for is to see if we've got anybody that's running for office or anybody that any uh, uh, we, buddy that we, we should recognize. We do have a couple of candidates on online. And if they would raise their hand, I can take them off of mute or ask them to come off. That's great. What we like to do at the beginning of all of our events is to uh, give folks a, a minute or two just to introduce themselves, especially our candidates who, who might not be recognized. So, uh, yeah, we've got a few. And um, let me let me start with uh, I saw Phil Moore just a second ago. I'm here. Phil, you've got the floor. You got a couple minutes. Please thank, introduce thank yourself. Let us know what you're up to. Thank you, Phil, and thanks for, for having me, uh, Space Coast Progressive Alliance. I'll be brief. So if those who are, everybody on, on is probably very uh, politically astute and understands that there's a special election being held right now in Palm Bay. The election date is March 8th. Uh, and really, it's there's four candidates, and it's going to be a close race because, you know, they're nonpartisan races, but it's going to be close because the votes are going to be split uh, by four individuals. And so we're looking at trying to get as many people out uh, to support me so that we can win the special election. And then we have to rerun again in November. So this is a short term position, six months, uh, but we really wanna get in there and do the work we can in the six months. It'll really help uh, solidify Palm Bay and make sure that we are doing the good work for the city of Palm Bay and for South Brevard. You know, local elections matter. They matter m more now than we probably ever thought as they've been under attack um, and they'll continue to be under attack. So we need to make sure that we're electing people that will help make sure that we protect and strengthen our local politics um, and work together to make sure that we're not continually under attack at the municipal level at the school board level. And that's the reason why I'm running and that's why I need your help. So if you can, please come out this weekend. We will have canvassing uh, events the entire weekend um, at Fredley Park. I welcome you to in I invite you to join me and join us as we try to make sure that we're knocking as many doors to let as many people know that I need their vote and their support. So I'll, I'll leave it at that and would look forward to anybody's help and support. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Phil. And uh, one of the things that we always like to remind people is that the Space Coast Progressive Alliance, by policy, is nonpartisan. We don't endorse candidates, um, but we have to say thank you to anybody that's willing to run for office, anybody that's willing to serve uh, us. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I was just going to mention that we had two other candidates, Kim and Joanne. I see. In fact, I tell you what, I was just going to select uh, Joanne. Uh, Joanne, uh, are, is your mic live? 
I think it is. Can you hear me? You have the floor for a minute or oh. two, please. Tell us about yourself. Well, thank you very much. And thank you very much for inviting me. I'm really excited to hear the speakers tonight. Um, so my name is Joanne Terry. I'm a retired satellite engineer from the space industry, and I'm running to be our U.S. congressional representative because I, I actually think we deserve better representation than what we've been getting. And I think we're better than the loud extremism that's been getting a lot of national attention lately. And I just want to echo what what um, what Phil was saying earlier about this about civility in our politics and really need, needing to provide that leadership at the top to bring civility back into our politics. I actually believe that we have more in common as a district. If we, if we look at the underlying values and the underlying goals of what we wanna achieve in our everyday lives. And my campaign is all about finding those, those common goals and common values so that we can bridge our divide and start to talk talk to each other again and come up with real solutions for our for our problems or for our issues here in um, the space and the treasure coasts. So I'm sure you'll be hearing a lot more from me in the in the coming months. And um, you can go to my website, joanneterry.com to find out more about me. And um, one of the big things themes of my campaign is that I want to get loud to generate group hope to combat all the group hate that is really seems to be really loud in our district right now. So, so thank you very much. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, Beth Moore, I see that you have your hand up. Are you a candidate? Are you running for office, Beth? No, okay, so you've, you've got your hand up. You may wanna click on that and take that back down. Uh, I see we have Kim Huff. Kim, uh, please introduce yourself and, and tell us about your uh, election or your uh, candidacy. Hi, I'm Kim Huff. I am part of Families for Safe Schools, so I will be speaking about some other things coming up, but I am running for School Board District 5, um, and I'm doing it because I really want to protect our public schools. I want to protect our public schools from the, I, I mean, I guess we'll use the word hatred towards um, just really allowing our children to, to freely learn to um, be who they are. And I wanna protect our teachers because without them, we, we don't have a very strong <laughs> educational system. And I, I just wanna protect it for my kids and for other people's kids so that we can um, raise really smart, responsible little humans that will go forth and you know, live in our community, create businesses. Thank you very much, Kim. That's a, a great, great story. We're looking forward to hearing you tonight as part of our panel. I'm sure that the question of your candidacy will come up and we'll talk more about it then. We still have a few more minutes for community announcements. If, uh, if anybody is on board and you have a community announcement to make regarding another organization or an event, something you'd like the community to know about, we'll give you a minute to uh, take the floor and, and tell us about what you're up to. If you have a community announcement, please raise your hand and we'll recognize you. Uh, you can raise your hand one of two ways. You can actually physically raise it or we'll be watching for you, uh, or you can use the uh, Zoom capability. Zoom has a little thingy uh, somewhere, depending on whether you're on a laptop or whether you're on a phone or whether you're on a, a, an iPad, uh, and you have to look for uh, the little uh, thingy that says reactions. Click on the reactions button and it'll show you how to raise your hand. And uh, if I haven't seen anybody that has a community announcement yet, uh, taking a quick look through, I see somebody who's got their thumb up uh, and that's Carol Becker. Do you want to, Carol, do you have a comment? So Carol, let me uh, see if I can. I can, I asked her. There got it. Go. Carol, you've got, got, you got the floor for a minute. Okay, thank you. Real quick, I just wanted to make people aware of uh, House Bill 741 and Senate Bill 1024. Those have to do with net metering and Florida Power and Light. And for those of us who are pro-solar, uh, this is a bill trying to um, get rid of net metering, which really helps us help our communities, those of us who have solar. So if you can write to your representatives or senators and tell them that you're not in favor of either one of these bills, that would be appreciated. Yeah, the, uh, I'll tell you what, sustainable energy is obviously critical to the future, not only of our community and our state, uh, but the future of our planet, the future of our species. Uh, if we can't get this right, if we can't wean ourselves off of fossil fuels, 
uh, then we've got a problem. And this net metering bill that uh, Carol, who's our treasurer, by the way, was just mentioning, uh, we're in real trouble. The, the, the bill is a bad bill. Uh, I've, I, anyway, for what it's worth, I could throw my two cents worth in there to say, yeah, this is one we need to fight. There, there are a number of, of uh, items moving through our Florida legislature right now. Uh, as Ryde mentioned earlier, and, and I think we're going to hear more of it tonight, uh, there, and there's some things that are really bad uh, in a lot of different ways. So please pay attention. Please, please contact your elected representatives, uh, either to support a bill or to oppose it, but, but don't sit quietly back and think that your voice doesn't have any uh, impact. Because I tell you what, uh, one phone call might not have so much impact, but a dozen calls or a hundred calls or a thousand calls, uh, they will pay attention to it. And so please, uh, we encourage civic engagement. It's very important. Um, I have not seen anybody else raising their hands with uh, for uh, community announcements. So I think we may just proceed. Um, hopefully I haven't missed anybody. Um, very good. Well, let me do a quick introduction. Uh, Families for Safe Schools. Uh, they are an organization that has been involved <clears throat> Uh, especially recently uh, to, to change our community for the better. Uh, they formed uh, really during the pandemic uh, because they saw what was happening, especially at our school board meetings. <clears throat> and and uh, they, they recognized, as most of us did, the, the people attacking our school board members was completely unacceptable. And some of the ideas that were being presented were really contrary to the best interests of our community, uh, our children, our teachers. Uh, and they wanted to step forward to help fight that, to help fix it, to help work with other people, uh, to stand up against um, misinformation, disinformation about the vaccines, mask wearing, um, the pandemic in general. Uh, and personally, I think they've done a, a very remarkable job. And it is an honor tonight to have uh, four speakers from um, families for Safe Schools. I would like to, by the way, take the opportunity to remind everybody once again that we are live on Facebook. We are live streaming on, uh, we're live streaming on Facebook and recording. We're live here on Zoom, obviously, together. Um, and uh, so if you've missed part of the meeting or you would like to see it later, uh, you can always go to our Facebook uh, site. Um, our website will have information, and, and the website for the Space Coast Progressive Alliance is www.scpaflorida.com. Uh, or if you look at it behind me, we actually have .org as well, if you prefer the .org part. Anyway, uh, we'll be starting off tonight with four wonderful speakers, and uh, the first will be uh, Jabari Hosey. Jabari is the Families for Safe Schools president. Um, he manages a global SATCOM company. Uh, he is a father of three. Uh, we'll have uh, Michelle Barineau. She is the vice president of Families for Safe Schools. She's a management consultant uh, and a mom of a sixth grader. Uh, Cheryl Wachewski, who is the uh, secretary for Families for Safe Schools. And she's a biochemistry professor, a scientist, a mother of two. Uh, and last but not least, uh, Kim Huff community volunteer and a mother of two. We've already heard Kim talk. Uh, all four of these uh, fine people are, are leading this wonderful group and they each will be taking some time to talk to us, to educate us. Uh, and then after uh, an hour or so, uh, we'll be taking questions from you. So if you have uh, questions, uh, we'll have a good Q&A period uh, following the panel and uh, hopefully we'll get your questions answered. Uh, we all very much look forward to your engagement, your involvement, um, and uh, I would like to, all of you to take your time, and this is our guests on the Zoom meeting, see if you can figure out how to raise your hand when you need to, when the time comes in our Q&A, so, uh, so that we can see you and, and answer your questions. So again, it's in the reactions section, you can look for that. Um, and hopefully I've done a reasonable job of introducing everybody, but I'm going to open the floor to our entire panel. And first, Jabari Hosey, the president of Families for Safe Schools. Welcome. Thank Sir, you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. And thank you, uh, Space Coast Progressive Alliance, for even allowing us to be here today and to speak to everyone, to tell our story, uh, how we began, uh, what we stand for, and what we're currently doing. I think it's very important. Um, and 
for my opening part, I'd like to tell, uh, kind of walk through our story of how we began. Um, and all the way from, uh, <laughs> seems like a long time ago, but it's really only been eight to nine months ago. Uh, feels like about eight years, but uh, to where we are today. Um, so uh, this organization, um, it's been a whirlwind. Like I said, it's been about eight months uh, since any of us had come together in any capacity. Uh, we have seven current board members and many volunteers. Uh, this organization is uh, grassroots. So no one on this board knew each other prior to establishing this organization. Um, no one planned initially to establish any organization. This uh, happened organically. Um, so I'm gonna back up, I'm gonna take us back about eight to nine months ago. Uh, most of us initially joined a Facebook group that was called Mandate Mass in Brevard Schools. Um, this group had roughly 100, 200 members at the time. Uh, the goal was to bring awareness uh, for what was happening with COVID. Um, it was, it wanted to make sure that the Brevard Public Schools implemented a mask requirement as the primary mitigation strategy at the time. Um, even though we were going in the opposite direction, we, there were parents and community members that wanted to make noise to make that go the other way. Uh, and what many of us witnessed at home uh, prior to attending the school board meetings, uh, as we watched these school board meetings and watching the decision-making process, uh, we saw a lot of anti-mask rhetoric. Uh, we saw um, highlights and news stories and flashes of our own school board, um, the public comment, um, and most of us were shocked. Um, and instead of screaming at the TV <laughs> or running behind our keyboards and uh, commenting, we made sure that the next time we're gonna be at the school board meeting because this small group that was loud, um, they, they, they made the assertion that they were the majority of parents. Uh, they had the majority opinion of us parents. And um, the shock of what they were saying was kind of carryover to some of the anti LGBTQ plus sentiment that was shared months prior, uh, the attacks on one of our school board members, Jennifer Jenkins, in the school board room outside. Um, so uh, most of us were just tired of seeing this. So we decided to voice our grievances to the school board. Um, many of us connected there. Uh, we were speaking. Um, we were engaging um, with folks outside. We, we were just attending and wanting to be seen and heard so that it was understood that that group did not represent us. Um, so as we were sort of connecting the dots, uh, we were all a part of this Facebook group. Um, we were either moderators or just within the group, just actively posting, commenting. And uh, within this group on Facebook, we, we planned, uh, we wanted to get a little more organized. There were ideas of petitions, we pushed emails. We went to send emails to Brevard Public Schools, to our representatives, to our legislators, uh, anyone that impacted our schools. We uh, went into protests outside of the school. Um, we had individuals reaching out to local newspapers, local media, uh, anyone to get attention, uh, basically, so we can expand our voice and our exposure uh, with with what was going on in the school in the school board room and what was going on with the decision making at the time with COVID, um, so at this point, we are where there's a loud group that's gaining media attention. We have uh, our own state representatives that are saying things, uh, trolling people, um, bringing national and negative attention to the county. We have school board a few school board members whose opinions somehow just completely. Uh, did a 360, no longer were certain mitigation strategies or certain um, appreciation of our students or inclusion of our students seem to be polar opposite of the direction that they went to go in. Um, so at this point, us moderators uh, or admin in the group, we, uh, we had discussions of becoming more organized, um, basically to the point to becoming a nonprofit. Um, like I said, we organically came together on issues. 
Uh, none of us sat down initially and said, oh, I like this issue. I don't like this issue. It, it literally organically, we came up with nearly the same list of issues that we've either witnessed or we believe we could improve on in our schools. Um, we didn't want to, the, one of the first things we didn't want to do, uh, something that differentiates us from uh, some of the noisemakers, uh, some of these other groups is we, we didn't want to point fingers at the school. We didn't want to um, bring lawsuits against the school. We wanted to find solutions. Um, and rather than doing that, because we trust the schools with our children, we know that they're they're going to try and do what's best for their well-being. And at the end of the day, we want our kids in school learning um, to with the school's best ability. Um, but COVID, as we know, pretty much has ravaged our school district. Um, and while our school district is struggling with staff, struggling um, to to in and out a lot of sickness, all all of this is occurring and still some of it's currently still occurring. Um, we didn't feel like kicking the school while they're down uh, was the answer. Um, so in partnering with the schools, we would find solutions. We would try and block these political or these verbal attacks, have a more uh, common ground, um, along with making sure that the best leadership should be in place. Um, we, we don't want uh, leaders that feel like they need to pander to certain groups of folks, not out of the best decisions, not behind science, but just out of potentially getting votes or having support. Um, we wanted to make sure that uh, our schools were an inclusive environment. Uh, we wanted to identify the issues in our schools, such as potentially social bias and find solutions with them. Um, we have our teachers back. Uh, we wanna make sure that the teachers also have the support they need. Um, we we are want to identify issues even amongst our staff, even amongst our teachers, potentially with uh, demographics, right? Our representation. We want to make sure our teachers represent our demographics. We want to make sure that when we are discovering the data, we have things like an equity audit. When we know there's a gap with certain students, we want to address those gaps. We want to actually get things done and make all of our schools great schools. Um, so that was our focus. It was not the focus on attacking and not finding solutions. It's finding solutions, working with the school, partnering with other, other organizations, making sure the right people are in the right places and leadership in doing so. Um, so at that point, this is happening pretty fast. So this is all happening within two to three months, I wanna say, uh, very tight time window. I mean, we are running back and forth. There, there are a good, a good group of volunteers that are, that are helping to support. We were able to kind of create committees, subcommittees, but a lot of this is happening very quickly. We're doing interviews and all these different things. At this point, we wanted to, um, we changed the name of the Facebook group. Uh, we changed the name to Families for Safe Schools. Um, we knew it was, it, it, the mask was one thing, but we knew we had to be a little more inclusive. And we also wanted to make sure that we are covering all the schools by protecting them. We, we don't want, um, we didn't want that to be the sole focus. So we changed our name at that point uh, in the Facebook group. We began a strategy of outreach, uh, reaching as many like-minded individuals out there. We didn't care about their political persuasion. We didn't care about uh, any of that. We wanted to find as many folks who wanted their children to have the best education possible. Uh, in doing so, our membership expanded from roughly 200 folks to just under 2,000. Uh, that's in a matter of less than two months. That's a lot of people. <laughs> that's a lot of activity. That's a lot of like-minded folks. Um, so at, at this point, it's around October of last year, we officially became Families for Safe Schools, a nonprofit. Um, we continue to learn. We continue to partner uh, with various organizations. We're gonna get into that a little bit later who we're partnering with, who we're working with, working with the school district, um, still pushing for improvements, of course. Um, we're trying to then shield our school from these political attacks on our public educational system. 
So it's a layered approach. We have uh, a few layers to what we're doing. We're gonna describe what those layers, those activities um, are a little further along with um, some of our other board members here on this call. Um, but we have a much larger social media footprint at this point. We have a website, we have a core volunteer group, we have all of these partnerships. Um, and we also have members that are uh, seeking elected office, which is great. Um, so that is, that's the story of our inception. That's the story of where we began, grassroots, um, and where we'd like to go and where we'd like to continue to go. So that's my uh, story. So I'd like to pass it along to our next speaker. Hello, thanks Jabari and thank you all. Um, we are very, very grateful to, to be here to uh, discuss this these issues with you folks. Um, so I wanna go over our six pillars. Uh, Jabari said that we very quickly found out that we all shared common ground on, on what the group should focus on and, and what should be our core. Um, and Michelle, listen, you, you may wanna introduce yourself just for a second. Oh, okay. <laughs> My name is Michelle Barano. I'm one of the vice presidents for Family for Safe Schools. And I, as Jabari said, I was a member of the original Facebook group and I went to my very first board meeting in April of last year. And as I sat there watching insanity all around me and people, it, it was like the emperor's new clothes. People were saying science wasn't science and COVID wasn't real and just speaking, things were coming out of people's mouths. And I, I felt like I was in some sort of alternate universe where we're, where things had different meanings. And, um, I, you know, there were a few of, of us from the, um, the group, Cheryl in particular, uh, we kept looking at each other like, is, is this really happening? What, what is going on here? Um, and it went beyond just the mask issue, just uh, the thing, the books, the anti-LGBTQ things. And, and it just really fired me up uh, to realize that uh, if, if, if I sit around and, and hope someone else will take care of this problem, the people who are showing up at these board meetings screaming are gonna be the only voices heard. And um, we, all, we all came together because we, we just, we care and we can't let that happen. So um, that's, that's why I'm here and that's why I'll continue to fight. Uh, we actually moved to Brevard two years ago, right before the pandemic. And I picked Brevard because of the strong public schools and to watch them attempting to be dismantled uh, right when we got here, that, that was terrifying. So um, I, I think we all care about our kids and um, we all need to, to come together to support a strong public education system. And that actually is the first of our, of our six pillars, uh, defending public education. Um, public education is, is the, it's the nursery for our communities. This is where our children learn. And as, as Kim said, become uh, responsible adults and, and learn how to think for themselves, become contributing members of our society. Even if you don't have children in public school right now, what's happening in these schools is going to affect your life if you remain in this community. Uh, the students of today are gonna be tomorrow's doctors and service workers and business owners and bus drivers and, and everything. And we all have a vested interest in making sure that we have the best possible society by having the best educated citizens. Um, so we value, we support public education. We've got to invest in it. Um, right now, uh, our, our pillar is called defending public education as opposed to just supporting public education because frankly, public education is under attack right now. It's under attack in a couple of ways. Um, there's politicization of um, things like science and history, and there's a culture war that has been dragged into our school board meetings, and it is uh, trying to divide us and chip away at our public education and the, and the things that we teach and who gets to teach them and how they get to say it. And then there's also a financial war um, with, with uh, diverting public funds that are supposed to be going towards all of the students in the county. And... Um, there were people taking advantage of the COVID situation to get uh, vouchers for, for private school. And that, that just sucks resources away from everybody. Um, so there's, there's a two front war on defending public education. Um, another pillar is supporting teachers. It's funny when, when COVID first happened and everyone was homeschooling, all you could see on Facebook was 
oh my gosh, I had no idea. There were all these memes about, you know, about uh, how much, you know, when you said my teacher, my student was a great kid, uh, clearly you were lying because now I can see it. And uh, there was all this support for teachers. And I don't know when that went away, but it seemed to go away pretty quickly. Um, these people have an incredibly difficult job and that we're entrusting them to, to mold our, our children into those citizens of the future. And, and they are not being paid well. They're not being paid what they deserve. They're not getting the respect. Um, most of these people have, have master's degrees. They've studied this topic because that's what they want to do for a living. They are willing to accept the pay that this job gives because most of them are passionate about what they do. They want to teach. It is a calling um, more so than just a profession. And they're being attacked right now. Um, there are There's legislation that will open the way for, for parents to sue educators because they said something they disagreed with. Um, there is um, legislation that is looking to take away some of the, um, the input that our experts have in designing the curriculum. They're, they're favoring parents over educators in designing the curriculum, which is sort of like letting letting a parent uh, fill their child's tooth instead of trusting the dentist to do it. Um, th there's never been more attacks on teachers that, that I've seen in my lifetime. And we believe they should be paid and treated like professionals. Um, and we are seeing the results of this not happening. We're seeing teachers dropping out left and right. Uh, young people who got into the profession are saying that they're not going to stay in it very long. And people are choosing other careers because it's just not worth all of the grief. Um, my daughter's uh, elementary school teacher, um, during when COVID was was in one of the surges, uh, the custodian left because he couldn't risk his health, and they couldn't find a replacement. So my daughter's teacher, in addition to teaching 24 sixth graders, doing her lesson plans, everything that she has to do, now she's got to sweep her floor. Um, that that that's that's just not. That's not how a strong public school system works or should work. And we've got to be the voice for our teachers. Um, and we've got to show them the appreciation and the respect that they deserve. Um, another one of our pillars is uh, teaching inclusive and accurate history. Um, the his history happened and glossing over it and denying it is not doing anybody any favors. Um, in order to learn, you have to open your mind to new ideas. That's, that's the whole point. Um, and being told how we got to this point in, in, in our country, what came before, will help us decide where we go in the future and what comes after. Because um, I guess all the, all the great truths become cliches. If we don't learn from our history, we are doomed to repeat it. And seeing some of the, the censorship that's happening, and um, it's almost like there's... Um, a hatred against certain ideas and people are trying to block them out uh, so that they're not even discussed. Now, we understand that there are things that must be age appropriate. Um, I don't want to teach the Holocaust to a kindergartner. I think that's a really bad idea and no one is advocating for that. But there are things that should be taught at certain ages. Um, children of in, children who are, are Black are taught early on about racism because they have to face it every day. And I feel that if black children are capable of learning about racism and experiencing racism, then certainly children of other races should be, should be able to learn about that as well. Um, and if only the black children are learning about racism, then how do the other people stop doing it? Um, if you don't teach these things, no one will learn them. It's that simple. Um, so our history is very complex. We've got lots of bright spots in it. We've got a lot of dark spots in it. Um, and, and it's important that we discuss all of them and, and learn from them and have a better future. Another pillar is gun safety. Um, I think every parent uh, who hears about gun violence in the school goes through the same well, I, actually, I take it back. Not every parent, because there are people who, who don't seem to want to keep guns out of schools. We definitely feel that schools should be able to attend school and, and not worry about the threat of gun violence. Um, these active shooter drills have, have traumatized um, lots of, of kids. And, and that's another thing. You talk about age-appropriate education. We are teaching 
our children at inappropriate ages, that they are not safe in school and that the adults in the room can't protect them. Um, we believe, we acknowledge the Second Amendment. We, we understand there's a right to bear arms, but our places of learning are not appropriate places. For, for guns. Only trained re school resource officers should be carrying guns on school property. Um, we believe in what are everyone calls common sense gun safety laws. We need to strengthen the red flag laws so people who have shown that they are not responsible to carry guns don't get them because what happens in the communities finds its way into our schools. Um, and we need to close these loopholes that are endangering our community and our schools. We also believe in advocating for the rights of LGBTQ students. Um, people should be able to feel safe and accepted for who they are, especially in a house of learning. Um, we're very concerned about some of the current legislation that's coming out, which we'll get into all of this a little bit later. Um, telling a student that they can't talk about who they are or they can't talk about their family, maybe if they come from a same sex uh, parent family, are you not allowed to talk about your family in class when everyone else is doing it? Um, and how how can a teacher, the, 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 the don't say gay bill, how can a teacher navigate a, a, a landmine filled discussion like this when they're under threat of being sued or reprimanded for discussing a student's identity? Um, I mean, some of these things, when you break them down into little pieces, they, they, they're kind of sound insane. Um, censorship just doesn't work. Um, we need to make sure that these discussions are age appropriate, but this is reality. This is the world we live in. There are LGBTQ people in our world. Let's just acknowledge this and find out how best we can all have the same rights in this amazing country. Um, and the other pillar that we have is COVID-19 mitigation, which is a, just a general uh, safety uh, consideration. Um, we believe that rather than listening to a governor or a, another politician, we should be getting our advice from the American Medical Association, the Centers for Disease Controls, the American Academy of Pediatrics, because these are the experts who have studied um, infectious diseases and their mitigation. We need to respect these decisions. We need to consider them. And we need to make sure that we are taking appropriate uh, mitigation strategies to keep our children safe because we all want our children in school. Nobody wants nobody wants to be, anyone who wants to be e-learning is e-learning already. The rest of us sending our kids to school are doing so and we want them to be as safe as possible. Uh, we understand that no one is 100% safe, but um, you know, you've got to do the bare minimum when there's a, a worldwide pandemic and the experts are saying everyone inside should be masked. We should be masked. Um, we're not doing it because we love masks or we want to suffocate anyone or or take anyone's freedom. It's it's a common sense safety measure that the experts are saying works. So these are the basic pillars that we have. And um, we'll get into uh, greater detail. Um, a lot of the legislation that's happening right now directly falls on, under these pillars. Um, a lot of things in the news right now that don't say gay bill, the book banning, um, all of these things are, are real and alive and current and need to be addressed. A lot of this, this legislation will be voted on this year and could become law. And that's gonna be a lot harder to fix. Um, so we've got to get out in front of these things. We've got to start talking about them, having real dialogue, not just standing in a room screaming at people who are just trying to do their jobs. So I will turn this over to, is it Cam I believe is next? And um, obviously we'll be discussing these issues and taking questions, thanks. Hi, I'm Kim Huff, and I am going to be um, talking about some of the legislation that was brought up by Michelle. Um, some things that we're watching, some things that we're, we know we're going to have to navigate in the coming, um, probably next school year. A lot of these things we expect will pass because of the climate in Tallahassee and the who's in charge. Um, and so I'm gonna talk about a, a few of the things that we're specifically concerned with um, pertaining to our students and schools. So um, one of the big ones um, concerns the testing. Uh, Governor DeSantis 
said that we were going to eliminate the big FSA tests and start to monitor kids in a, in a more regular fashion so that their education could be more tailored to where they're at. And this sounds like wonderful news to everyone. I don't think there's a parent anywhere that um, wants their children to practice more, to take a state test every year. Um, so this bill talks about what, what are we going to do? And really it's about hiring just a different company to test our children. So the big end of the year state test is not removed. They are actually testing more. They will be computerized testing children all the way to pre-K, which is a whole nother issue. A lot of those children um, are not as, they don't use mice in the same way. Like a lot of the training at the kindergarten level already starts to train children how to take these tests by practicing how to use a mouse and click on things. And so even before they start taking these um, end of year state tests, they're practicing how do you test, how do you test, how do you test. And so a lot of teacher time is taken up with teaching children how to take tests. And instead of just learning the materials that they need to learn. So um, another problem with this bill is that um, the companies who sell these tests to the state are determining what the um, assessment, the assessments are about rather than teachers. So rather than, again, professionals who um, understand what they're, what they're teaching children, how children should be assessed, uh, we're relying on companies who make money to create programs to test children. And so the elimination of the FSA is really not happening, maybe in, in its current form, but they, they will be still testing the children, maybe even more frequently, and still have this final test at the end of the year, in addition to testing more grades than we currently test. So I, I know that one of the big groups, um, the FEA, is very against this because they lobbied to remove these state tests and they feel a little tricked because now instead of removing the state test, they're just getting a different form of the state test. So that's one bill to be watching. Um, it is number, it's Senate Bill 1048 and House Bill 1193, and it's about state testing. Another um, bill, eight, House Bill 1587, um, this is about the parental rights in education, and this is the don't say gay bill. And this um, requires that school district personnel um, encourage students to communicate with their parents regarding their well-being, which these are, there's, there's verbiage in these that sounds so great when you're reading them at first, but then as you continue to write, read them, the legal terms start to muddy what's actually going to happen. And so the concern that is happening is that parents and parents have the right to be in charge of their children's mental health, their physical health, their education. Um, these are all things we've always had rights to, but um, our governor felt that we needed a bill of parental rights to tell people what your right to do with your child was. So we've always had the right to choose how we wanted to school our children, whether it be a public school, homeschooling, private schooling. Um, now we have e-learn or virtual school. Um, we've always had those rights. We've always had the rights to um, control every aspect of our children's minds um, by how we choose to educate them. 
And so the, these bills really come as a companion piece to the parental bill of rights. So the don't say gay bill also is um, encouraging schools to out children to their parents for the sake of their parents knowing about their well-being. And so some children don't feel safe doing that. And this bill is incur um, encouraging staff to, to do that. And I think there's a right way this could go. I just kind of feel that sometimes when we make laws about um, individual human lives, kids who are in a very fearful position of how their parents might react, um, having a, a teacher call a parent and try to force their child to tell them about things that are happening that they're afraid to tell their parents is a, is a dangerous thing. They need to have trusted adults in the schools as well as um, at home. But sometimes children um, talk to their teachers more than they feel like they can talk to their parents. And as a parent, I hope my kids feel that way about a, a trusted adult in a school. Um, my children talk to me about most everything still, but I know that there will probably be a time when they're maybe not far from now when they're teenagers and they want it, they need to go to someone else. And I hope that there's someone that they feel comfortable enough to trust. So this goes back to that we, we trust our teachers, we trust our administrations. Um, and if I didn't, I would absolutely pull my children out of public schools. And so there's a certain amount of um, trust and faith that I put into other people's hands when I drop them off at the school every day. And so again, going back to what Michelle said about the don't say gay bill is that these children will also be silenced from their own identity, essentially, if they feel that they can't, just even hearing the bill, don't say gay. Um, I mean, I, I would imagine that that makes children afraid if they are gay, if they have parents who are gay, if they have a sibling who's gay. Um, this is a dangerous time in their lives to tell them that we can't talk about this. And so considering that um, the LGBTQ community of teenagers has a higher suicide risk than regular teenagers, this bill is, is sad um, that we are going to alienate children from being their true selves because their teachers can't talk about it. So I'm going to try not to get emotional about that because it just, it breaks my heart a little bit. Um, and it does allow this, the parents to sue the schools. Our, our government is giving parents permission to sue schools for things they don't agree with rather than trying to find solutions to problems by talking to administrations or administrators, by talking to teachers, by trying to find solutions if you really, really don't agree with someone in the way that they're doing something to try and find a solution to that problem rather than um, villainizing our schools and our teachers. So that is House Bill 1587, or no, I'm sorry, 1557. Um, another Senate bill is called, uh, 148 is called the Individual Freedom Bill, and some of these aren't technically named, but um, they say named to be determined, but this is also the Stop Woke Bill. So this is just another, um, another bill where the, the government is telling our teachers and our schools how they're going to discuss um, issues on, on race and sex in the classrooms. And to some degree, the age appropriateness of how they want things to be taught is very vague. It's very loose. We talk about like whether you, you're teaching something consciously or unconsciously, you have bias. Um, the verbiage in these have a lot of room for interpretation, which I think is problematic. 
considering that it would be a law, um, it would be hard to interpret. But also, again, we're giving parents the right to sue schools over issues that we should be allowed to um, discuss in a classroom. And I'm not saying that we're trying to um, convince children about what they are, or who they are, but we should be able to talk freely and openly about their issues when they bring them up. Now, some of these bills do have parts that allow for discussion for teachers to answer questions. But I feel, again, this is a very like slippery slope. Like when does it, did a child, how does a teacher prove a child asked a question that they're answering and they say is something that a, a parent doesn't interpret properly. So these are just um, the racial and sexual discrimination that is happening um, through these bills is dangerous for our kids. Um, and so while I believe, and I think we all believe in, in on the board that these things will probably likely pass and we're gonna have to somehow figure out how to navigate this for our students and our teachers. Um, we're already trying to figure out some solutions and I don't wanna say loopholes, but some workarounds because really, um, it's not in the best interest of our kids. It is a way that our legislators are talking to their base. Um, there are certain things that people are protected by federal civil rights and your race and your sex happen to be part of those, those rights that you're protected under. And these things will be litigated. The, the problem is, is that the these laws will pass and then lawsuits will come about. And then we wait for those lawsuits to reverse the rules. Well, meanwhile, our children are gonna have to exist. Our teachers are gonna have to exist in these environments where they do not feel that they, I mean, really that they really have the freedom to speak openly about real things, about things that are part of our reality and our world and our history. And so it's really important that people know what's happening because I was actually reading through trying to find specific bills that might have things a little bit hidden in them because a lot of them are intertwined. And I, I found a lot of very like disturbing things that are being talked about in Tallahassee regarding um, just regular civil rights, people's rights to be who they are, regardless of their race, religion, or sexual orientation. And um, we're really, I don't know what kind of time frame we're trying to head back to, but um, it is not in this uh, century <laughs> remotely. So with that, I, I'm going to, I actually want to bounce it back to Michelle because we also have talked a lot about book banning um, amongst our group. We are not experiencing the, the level of book banning in Brevard yet that a lot of other counties in Florida are experiencing. I happen to be connected to several other county groups um, and people who are battling book banning on a level that is very, um, it's a very specific attack. It's um, black authors, it is LGBTQ authors and any content related to those two subjects. Um, it's something we need to watch for in this county. Uh, I don't know, Michelle, if you have some something to add to that. Um, I was on a call with um, a, an educators group that's statewide, and they were talking about how there is a push right now um, for when a book gets either quarantined, which means it's sort of like placed in a, in a holding pen off the library shelf until a decision is made on it, um, or if the decision is made to remove the book from the library, what happens in one county can then be applied to other counties. So they're looking to, again, take away some of the local decision-making from the boards 
and um, make the statewide decisions. So if one county decides that to kill a mockingbird is the epitome of evil and decide to remove it from their schools, that's going to affect everybody. Um, that's something that is is sort of in the works right now. Um, I, I don't know if, if it will be successful, but we do know, we all definitely know that there is a very coordinated effort behind the book banning. Uh, there is a group that is communicating, creating lists, uh, breaking apart and dividing up the task of pouring through every book for something objectionable to object to. Um, it is a, a very um, labor intensive task and there is, there is an army of people devoting themselves to this right now. And when you see stuff on the news that's happening in other states, um, this is this is going to come here. Um, the specific books are coming from a centralized list. Um, so while it might be nice to feel a little bit of safety, like this is happening in Tennessee or this just happened, you know, in Virginia, it's coming here, um, and we need to be prepared. Um, I want to turn it back to Cheryl. One second, Walker. real quick. I just oh, want to sure. I just want to say something real quick on that too, because I've also been really involved in um, not the actual banning of books, but in speaking with people who are have these lists who read the reasons that these books are pulled. It could be that there's one of the reasons, and these are literally things that are written on these forms. One of the reasons um, a book was pulled that there was too, too much French Creole in the book. There was too many Spanish words in the book. Um, I mean, it is they're they're going through library um the i don't remember what the name of the system is but you can just word search things they're not reading the content they are not evaluating a book in the way that a book should be evaluated and they're just mass filling out forms to pull these books off of shelves and um it's actually to coming out of Florida because I've seen some things that were submitted in Tennessee and it still had some Florida, the word Florida in it in several places. So it is, um, it is very organized. It is coming from somewhere higher above um, and it is being pumped out into counties for these groups to, I mean, literally censor um, specific voices. And that is another, as a parent, very terrifying um, thing to think about. One of the solutions, one of, I think, the easiest solutions I've seen anywhere is there's a county, I believe it was in Florida, that's looking to create an opt-out. So rather than removing the book and stamping out the idea from the school building, there is a they're pr proposing a procedure where if you object to a book, you write that book name down on a list in the media center saying that your child is not allowed to check it out. And that seems like the best solution that I've seen because I have, if you don't want your child to, I don't know your child the way you do. If your child is not at an age level where they can handle stuff that their peers can handle or that we all deem as age appropriate, I'm in no way gonna force that information on your child before they're ready for it. Every parent has the right to, to decide what is best for their child at different points in their life. What they don't have the right to do is prevent anyone else's child from learning it. And that's the problem with banning and censorship is it's a blanket a blanket removal of a concept from a, from a public space. And that is what we object to. And I think if we can all get behind this opt out, that solves the problem neatly because I respect your right to keep your child from, from checking something out that goes against your values or that you disagree with or that they're just not ready for. But don't make that decision for my child or for Kim's child or for Cheryl's child or for Jabari's child. Cheryl, I'm, I'm sure we're going to be talking a lot more about the book barreling, uh, banning. Cheryl, do you want to go ahead and, and do your introduction speech? 
Sure. First, I'll start off with, I know you all are jealous because these are the amazing people that I get to hang out with every day. <laughs> and just to circle back on what Jabari said, I mean, that first meeting a long time ago, when I met Michelle, I knew we were going to be friends because as everyone said before me, all of these things coalesced. And the one thing that I've learned from this group and also being here tonight with the Space Coast Progressive Alliance, and thank you again for having us. It's really an honor to be here, is that I learned that there are so many people who have these tenets, who have these beliefs, but I really believe that, especially in the past few years, they've really been afraid to come out. I mean, and especially with COVID, our group wants masking, um, is pro-science, and you know, of, of course, these people may have some immune system issues where they just, they don't want to be in that room. And so, I mean, I, our group has found out, and I'm sure that this group as well has found out there are so many of us who are wanting to work together. So uh, just as I, I'm Cheryl Wojciechowski, I'm the secretary of Family for Safe Schools. I have to confess, I'm no longer a biochemistry professor. I was. Now I'm a chief science officer and I work for a state department, United States Agency for International Development, and that's another thing is the people who are on the board and the volunteers, I mean, they, they have jobs and they have lives and children and families and so many things. But everyone that I've worked with on Families for Safe Schools just works tirelessly to they contribute their talents. We've got people, softwares, designers, Tamsin, the photographer, and so many people, Deb with media, who do such a great job every day. So, I mean, you got to hear from, from the other people from Families for Safe Schools here tonight. I wanted to kind of wrap it up to talk a little bit more about who we are as people, what we want to do in the community, and essentially have a shift away from the negativity that's been happening in our community around the nation, but also we've seen it really in our face in the community at the school board and work toward a collaboration. So as, as Jabari was talking about in, in the beginning, we really want to partner with schools, school boards, and teachers for the sake of our students. And I think right now we're at a, a critical time. I mean, it could go either way. And I think it's much more important to come together than to point out our differences. And we really need to help each other out during this time. And as been mentioned before, some of our community needs more help than others, just by the deficits of COVID and by the deficits that existed long before COVID. It's the time to lift people up and to try to understand each other, not to reinforce divisions in our community. And the folk, one of the focuses of our group is we really want to reach out and be a solution with that. So within our group, we've had extensive discussions. We've met with the school board and we had a few ideas that I'd like to present here about how to work with the school community. So first is, I think this is a low hanging fruit, is we're working on setting up school repair beautification projects. I mean, outside painting, cleaning, gardening, et cetera, anything that's needed. We have like, like Jabari was saying, 2000 people in the group with a lot of talent. and especially like I was talking about before, the sensitivities of COVID, it may be much easier to get people to come and meet outside where it's a little bit safer. And here we would also be looking to partner with maybe local businesses, with some of the big home improvement stores to work with us. Again, the name of the game is coming together as a community. Another big idea is to some kids just need mentors. And personally, I was a mentor for 11 years and it was one of the most rewarding things I've ever done. She now has a family of her own and she's the dean at a private school. And kids need someone sometimes in addition to their family to check up on them and to show them maybe a different career, a different way of life and to provide that variety. Now, this is not easy to do because if a kid expects you to show up, you better be there. And you better be in for the long haul. And as we all, you know, as, as parents and aunts and uncles, grandparents know that that isn't actually that long. Kids grow up really fast. So the commitment to a child would have to be for a few years, but it has to be 100%. You have to be all in. And the other thing is reaching out to the community. 
I know that there are so many amazing entrepreneurs and look at the companies that we have on the Space Coast and working with them on internships. So kids can see they can have some on-the-job experience and know what it's like in a certain career. So it helps guide them in their path. And I think this would also be a great way to really partner with the community. So as we set this in motion, this is what we're doing as a group, but I wanted you to know also about the individual steps people are taking. As you know, Kim is running for the school board. We have several volunteers. Both Kim and I are in the process of trying to become substitute teachers. I'm, in the, I'm doing the coursework right now. <laughs> so we really wanna focus on reliability, responsibility, respect, and community. We don't wanna pander to the politics since they may not go our way all the time. And as, as all of my colleagues have mentioned, we do wanna fight for certain legislation. We do want to support certain people, especially Kim, and but it may not happen all the time. And some things that may pass, like some of the bills that, that Kim was talking about, they could do some damage, especially to some of the populations. But we saw this with the lack of a mask requirement. This did a lot of damage to a lot of people. So Families for Safe Schools really want to encourage what Michelle discussed in the pillars, but we also want to be there to pick up the pieces when things don't go well. So we really want to be defined by our actions, the respect we show one another, our community, all across Brevard. So when you stand next to someone, work with them, it's really hard to call them other. So we really wanna to be together. So we want to, like I said, do in community. And while the individual is important, so is the community. And we love and honor the freedom that we have in this country. I've worked abroad for several years. And every time I landed back in the United States, I realized how important it is to have the freedom that we do. But freedom without responsibility is anarchy. And freedom, <clears throat> Sorry, without conscious is cruelty. And so this brings me to my last point about bringing trust back through our actions and through our partnerships. And the political climate now has moved a little bit towards distrust. And this, this is one of the reasons I got involved because as a scientist, as Michelle said, I couldn't believe some of the people, some of the things that people were saying. I mean, this is something that I've dedicated my life to was just being dismissed. And that's what originally brought me to, to the school board meetings. So these people who used to be our guides and mentors in society, the health professionals, the teachers, the scientists, historians now too, who studied for years, got their certification so they can do what they love. They do what they love to advance our society and they need our support. And we also must keep in mind that we are constant examples to our children, showing our children we can work together, respect education, and those who employ their education for the benefit of others, like the professionals that I just talked, that I just mentioned, will instill a stronger sense of community. So my goal is scientists must be trusted to do their actual peer-reviewed published research to be free from political accusations stemming only from their validated results. Historians must be free to tell the accurate truth. Doctors and other medical professionals who work long hours and know how to take good care of you, maybe even better than you do, to be free from harassment to do this. And as has been really drilled in, teachers need to be monitored or scripted to know what they're doing. And one of the teachers actually wrote to us in, in, the, in our website and said, parents have always had a way to talk to teachers. There's parent-teacher conference, there's the PTO, there's several avenues where we do seek out input from teachers. But ultimately, we have to respect them enough to let them do their jobs. So all the money that would go into modern-day teachers, let's purpose that for salaries, not bonuses. And the teacher who's paid her worth wouldn't have to get a second job and would have, and then probably would have greater retention and she, she actually might be happier too. <laughs> so we really want to put actions to words, partner, support the community, engender empathy, and return respect to each other, to the community, and to our, our professionals. And so I, I, that's pretty much all I had. You still have more time if you'd like to keep... Uh, oh, I do? Yeah, I want to. <laughs> you know, I'm not very long-winded. My, 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 my past students may not agree with me. Yeah, well, I can pick up a little bit while I have a little bit of time. Um, so we, we, as you see, brilliant folks uh, in our group. And 
we we are current, right? So we we do know what's going on. We do keep up with going with, with things that are moving either inside of our state, nationally, everywhere. We try and keep up with as much of these opportunities that may be coming our way. And one that is really big, one that uh, we are identifying is um, something that has really been in, in the media uh, very hard to the point where bills across the across multiple states have been made, and that is the critical race theory, um, which has never been taught in public schools, uh, K through 12 public schools. And if you, frankly, if you try to, I don't know what child would understand the constructs of uh, race and <laughs> and the role it plays in that sort of structure at a, a law, law um, school level class. But um, something that has come out of this is something like the stop woke bill that Kim was mentioning. Um, all of a sudden, diversity, inclusion, equality, um, race have been just dirty words. We we no longer want these things in our schools. What we're hearing from the other side, uh, we are fortunate enough that we have a, a diversity director, Dr. McKinnon, who is uh, who was brought in for, for, by Dr. Mullins, our superintendent. Um, prior to this attack. Um, so something that we're trying to be is preemptive. Um, we want our educational gaps. We want our staff and teacher opportunities to be met. Uh, and I believe our school, our public school knows this, and that's why they brought Dr. McKinnon in. Um, so we are working with her as well. Um, we know there is an education and a discipline gap that's getting wider across all students at our schools with the pandemic. Um, but there was a gap that was just as great before the pandemic, and it has now gotten even greater uh, with our students of color, particularly African-American. Um, if you're not aware, uh, we have over 60% of our African-American students not reading at grade level. Um, if you're not aware, uh, our representation in our staff is less than a third of our representation of our population. Uh, so that tells you we're about 15% Hispanic, 15% African American, yet we're three to 5% uh, of our teachers and, and uh, administrators are, are either. So we are, we're struggling in certain areas, um, but we have opportunities to work there. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to analyze we're trying to understand what the data provided from the school, um, how we can fix this. Um, we currently have over 80 schools in the district. 22 of those schools are at-risk schools. Basically, these are schools that are failing or, or, or you know, borderline failing. We have about half a dozen that are, are still on that cusp of being one of these 22 schools that needs a lot of assistance. Um, whether it's reinforcement with tutoring, volunteers, uh, beautification, there are many opportunities at these schools. Um, but a part of that is getting to the crux of this issue. Uh, this is not, um, compared to our other counties around us, we are the worst. So this is, we know it's a problem statewide, but why is it a problem, a Brevard problem, as opposed to an Orange County problem or Indian River County problem or Volusia County problem? we have a much larger problem that has been around for quite some time in this county. So, and what we're trying to do, one of our initiatives is to help Dr. McKinnon and our administration have a third party come in, what is called an equity audit, um, come in and take a look at what's going on um, from the administrative, administrative level all the way down to our students and what's going on at home, what's going on in the community, and take a look and try and come up with solutions to start bridging that this gap. There's no reason why we should have 22 of our schools. Uh, this is it's mind blowing. We have 22 schools that are failing. This is, is not, it's unacceptable. Um, so we are working preliminary. We've come up with ideas with uh, volunteering. We have, um, if, if anyone's not aware, we have the Moore curriculum that is also brought in. That's a part of something the diversity uh, director has brought in as well, partnering with the schools. But we also have um, many opportunities there um, trying to figure out how we can help that gap and, and the gap of all students, but primarily the students that are, um, that are disproportionately performing uh, worse. 
Oh, and on that same front, it's also disciplinary, right? We have a, if you're an African-American male, you're three to five times more likely to get a referral, be suspended, or have be reprimanded in some way by our school district. So our numbers are all off the charts. So we're trying to work with that as well. I just wanted to point that out while we had some time. Um, mm -hmm. That's one of our initiatives. So uh, that being said, that's that's all I have. Dr. McKinnon also just, she doesn't have any staff at all. And her job and her role is critical. And I would really like us to fill in where we can and to help her and her initiatives, because I'm, I'm really glad that she was brought on board. And I think she needs a lot of support. Well, I'll tell you what, I think it's probably about time for us to uh, uh, start thinking about opening the floor. Before we, before we do that, I would like to um, remind everybody that you are on the Space Coast Progressive Alliance uh, first Thursday event, uh, Families for Safe Schools. We are so proud and happy to have these four fantastic panelists with us. Um, and in just a few minutes, we're going to open the floor and, and start taking questions from you. I'm going to remind everybody, our guests to, uh, out, that are on Zoom, to look around and see if you can find the little reactions button where you can raise your hand. And when you do raise your hand, then we'll uh, start calling on folks and give you a, a couple of minutes. For, we're trying to spread this around as much as we can. We're going to limit you probably to three minutes uh, to ask a question, not make a statement or a grandstand or whatever. And we ask you that you ask a question that is uh, in, a, in a civil manner. Civil discourse is what we're all about here. And, and we really do uh, appreciate the fact that you're all here and hopefully you will participate. Um, the, uh, some of these questions or some of these uh, issues are, are really, really important for the future. Um, uh, you know, not just for today, but for uh, the rest of our lives, because it's the children that will shape our future, will shape our community. And if we, if we let our kids down, uh, we're letting ourselves down and we're, we're uh, doing a real disservice to our society. So having folks like uh, Families for Safe Schools, being willing to step up and do the hard work and take the risks and have people yell at them at, at, a, at a board meeting or, or whatever. Um, I, my hat's off to all of you. You guys are really great. And, and uh, uh, I am so glad to be here. And by the way, one of the questions that I have to ask right off the bat, I mean, everybody that's watching is saying, hey, who is this group? How can I join? Can I contribute? You know, is, is there, uh, can, can one of you, uh, Jabari, can you tell me uh, where would I go if I wanted to, uh, uh, make a contribution or if I wanted to join your organization? Well, I'll start with the joining. Um, right now you can go on um, Families for Safe Schools is on Facebook. Um, you can also go to Families for Safe Schools, um, familiesforsafeschools.com. Uh, we have a volunteer set up in, uh, section in there as well. You can learn more about us. Um, we are currently in process of setting up our bank account as well. So. I would say hold on to those donations for now, and uh, we'll be updating that uh, on our social media feeds as well as our website as soon as we are able to do that, which should be soon. Excellent. And, and hopefully uh, you'll be able to get some good response from tonight. And we ask everybody that's watching, spread the word. Um, as we always say during our events, if, if you uh, watch our events and you maybe you participate, but if you don't tell anybody else about what you've seen, uh, I think we've lost, we've, we've failed. Our goal is to, to spread the word. When we, when we have wonderful groups or interesting speakers, uh, we ask all of you, please spread the word, either via you know, social media, through your friends, you know, uh, around the uh, uh, water cooler at work. Um, tell people about what you're seeing. One of the next things I'm going to be asking our panelists about is I'm going to, uh, hopefully you've got some thoughts for action items, uh, uh, ideas that, that our guests, people that are viewing this can actually do something. Who can they call? What can they do? What, what should they do? We've already talked about legislation uh, that's pending in, at the state level, but obviously there are things that have to be done uh, here at the local level within our own school board. And, and if you're a parent within your kid's school as well, you can get involved and you can do so, all sorts of things um, through the PTO, uh, you support the uh, BFT, the, the teachers union. Uh, I know that uh, right now there's a very, very hot topic that uh, it, mm -hmm. supposedly legislation that, that's working its way through Tallahassee about cutting off salaries for school board members. I mean, that's insanity. Do you have a position on that? 
I, sure. I was going to actually, I have um, some action items that I would really love to um, talk about. Um, so we, as a group, ha have met with this district about pushing forward a mentoring and a volunteer program to help our kids like in the immediate future that especially need the extra help um, to be at grade level. And so COVID has been really, it's, it's been difficult for all of us in, a, in this group where we're very um, COVID cautious um, to get into classrooms and help these kids because the, the after school programs aren't always gonna work. Um, the after school tutoring um, ideas, like that's not always, is actually typically not possible to reach the kids that we need to reach. So I want to encourage people, if you have an hour a month to get your volunteer status at the district, you, you basically fill out some paperwork. They, they do a background check. I believe it's still free right now. They fingerprint you. Um, they just want to make sure that everyone they're putting in a classroom is safe. And you can call any principal probably in the district, but I would really love to see people call these, um, these low performing schools where things are a little bit more difficult because they need our help and they need, these teachers need our help to help these kids um, catch up really just ca they need to catch up. We want to graduate students who are reading where they're supposed to be reading. Um, it's so important. There's a uh, direct correlation between illiteracy and um, crime and prisoners. And so it's really, really important. Um, it's a passion that like a kind of a a pet project that I've really been trying to get people in our own group to do. So I started with give me an hour a month because I felt like everyone could find one hour in a month. And, and I think you also realize how, um, how great it feels to help these kids and, and how much they actually really appreciate it. They become like, um, little people who just kind of adore you and admire you in a way. And, and they, like my kids' classrooms, when the kids see me in the hallway still, they it's usually like my child's name, like, hey, Ethan's mom, you know? So um, it is, it's beneficial, like equally beneficial. So I would encourage people, if you can, to please volunteer. And um, there are mentoring programs. I know in the high schools, we're working to try to figure out how to find a district-wide um, a little bit of um, consistency across middle schools and high schools with the mentoring programs. But um, I know that the schools would take any and all volunteer help that you're willing to give. Um, and so that's like my big call to action, if you can. I came a question for you. Does, does sure. PBS have a name for that? Do they call it the registered mentor or, or something? What, what for, they... Well, so, I mean, you become a registered volunteer. If you want to become, oh, sorry, I just raised my hand on accident. Um, if you want to become a mentor, I was also told um, by the district that if you really were interested in mentoring, uh, you could probably ask any principal, like, hey, I'm really interested in mentoring, and they would find you five kids that you could mentor. So um, at any school. So that the mentoring part portion, there are organized mentoring programs in some of the high schools. I know specifically Coco, um, because I happen to know the person who um, is in charge of that. And I believe Hoover has a mentoring program. And so there are people who have set up individual programs with it. They're not like a district program. Um, if I might. The I'm volunteering sorry. part is just you go to the district. They have like their own office. You fill out, you know, you give your social security number and your name and they, they tell you all the rest of the things to do. And I saw that both Cheryl and Michelle had something to add. I, I want to echo what, what Kim said. Um, 
an hour a month. There are what, 42 of us on this, on this call. If just this group spend an hour a month, let's say eight months that school's in session, that's 336 hours that weren't there before of something positive happening in our schools. And if we all told everyone we know, or even just one person we knew, and we could add to that. I mean, this is a movement that could, could really make a difference in some kids' lives. And instead of just sitting at home and being angry and feeling bad and frustrated and helpless, just an hour a month can turn this thing around and create an example that could just really snowball. And I, I think Kim's idea is is just it, the little things. Um, you know, what's the, the saying? Oh, what's the easiest way to eat an elephant? It's one bite at a time. Mm. All of our issues are complex and and scary. And just the sheer number of bills we're fighting right now this year alone, it can overwhelm you. Step away from the elephant. Find the one spot on its flank you want to take a bite out of, and take that first bite. And if we all did that, that elephant would be gone. So I, I just can't emphasize enough what a difference each of us can make instead and Cheryl, of being helpless. And excuse me for cutting you off. And Cheryl, I know you wanted to talk. And by the way, we have questions that are starting to pile up in the chat uh, area. So Cheryl- I won't make this long. Away. Boy, do we need some help at those school board meetings. Even if you don't want to go in, and I understand that because of the atmosphere and the viral atmosphere, you may not want to go in, but just coming out and standing with us because we know that everybody looks out the window to see what the volume is. And I want to represent the people that I know are in Brevard County because they, they do, they look for numbers, they look for volumes. I do think that we are the majority. We have extra signs. If you do want to come in and speak, that would be an, an added bonus. But just to have some friends to, to you know, stand with us outside of those school board meetings it would be really, really wonderful. And if you do sign up, we, we put events up on our Facebook page and I think we're gonna move towards that with our, um, with our website too. But we could, we could, you could use some company there. <laughs> and on the, for everyone that's attending here on Zoom, if you go to the chat section, you can see that uh, there are some great um, links that are already listed. Cheryl's listed several of them, uh, links that you can go to for Families for Safe Schools, a Twitter link. Um, and uh, one of the things that people have already been asking about is, do you have on your website or on your Facebook page, a list of the le uh, legislature that you're targeting, uh, that, you're, that you're concerned about? Because frankly, the, the Space Coast Progressive Alliance is doing the same thing. Do you have such a list? We've started accumulating it. Uh, it's a current project. We're working on it and we will have it up fairly soon. And our first question should go to our president, Raed. He's been sitting there patiently with his hand raised. Uh, Raed, uh, you have the floor. Thank you, Phil. I'm, I'm trying to see if there's anybody else. I mean, I'll, I'll wait and I'll ask later on. I have, I have a question. But I want to see if there's anybody from uh, the attendees. Does anybody have a question? Do, we, do you see any hands up? Uh, I don't see it on my screen. Well, Kathy, Kathy Ebersberger's got a question. Do you want her to go first? Yeah, please. Let's let's have everybody else. I, 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 we, we appreciate them attending too. So let's let's have them go first. Kathy, you have the floor. Please limit it to three minutes. Okay. I was really intrigued by your idea of an opt out um, as, as a defense to the book banning. I wonder if it might be possible to put that program up for consideration before they start attacking books to be banned so that they don't get the publicity of the whole get the issue all all riled up everybody get everybody all riled up about the issue if we use that to just sort of take the wind out of their sails absolutely you got it you've got the uh, question yes ab absolutely it's on our short list we could, we could bring that up at a school board meeting easily. You know, it is, it is a horror that many people today don't really understand because we really haven't had to, to fight this fight. But it seems that every generation seems to have to somehow or another pick up the banner of saying, hey, wait a second, freedom, freedom to learn, freedom to read what you want to read. Uh, these are really fundamental freedoms. And many of these same people that are excited about book banning 
will go out and wave the flag of freedom for whatever their issue is, the freedom to carry weapons or to not wear a mask or whatever. But for some reason, the, they, they love to go back to this issue of banning books, and it takes us back, you know, 70 years to when things were ugly and before that still. Uh, so thank you again for fighting that one. I see we have uh, Karen Houston's got her hand raised. Hi. Uh, I just want to say thank you all for coming. This is very enlightening. Um, uh, I have a suggestion, a well, question, suggestion, however you want to take it. But um, uh, I work for organized labor, and I was just amazed to know that you all have uh, over 2,000 members now. And one of the things that we do is that um, we have these patch through calls. The, somebody's asked a question about the different you know, legislation the bills that are out there. Um, we have patch through calls where uh, we we set up certain um, bills that we're we are in, you know we have a problem that we're opposed to or uh, we support, uh, and all a person has to do is click on the on the call, click on the on the link, and it'll take them to um, directly to their um, legislator in their area. It'll give you a brief on on the phone. I'm not that astute when it comes to technical stuff, but all the people of listening to you all here. I'm thinking that someone within your group <laughs> has that capability. Um, it helps people because a lot of people, even though they may have joined you, uh, may not be so, um, they may be like me when it comes, I'm an old lady when it comes down to the technical stuff. But um, I figured it out eventually. Uh, but it helps people not to ha not have to look up um, who their legislators are, because believe me, um, I found out that most people don't know who their <laughs> legislators are. <laughs> Um, and if, if you only did it like you maybe um, once a week, whatever the great, the, the biggest field that you have that's important at the time, uh, set up a um, patch through call for them to click on. With 2,000 people and over 40 some people that we have here, just amazing how, how many calls can go in. And you know, if, if they don't actually want to talk to somebody, they can do it after, after um, you know, after five, whatever. Just get that voice in saying, I oppose this bill. And I think that you all have a wonderful organization. Um, I, I, we're in the middle of session right now, so my job is kind of crazy um, because the organized labor is constantly out there fighting. And some of the things that you all uh, talked about, we, we, we're opposed to as well. So I just want to mention that to you. I think that's a great avenue um, if you all think about it, the patch through calls to help people to get those calls out to <clears throat> um, people. <laughs> Thank you. Karen is thank you, Karen. Karen is our vice president, and uh, she's been so active in our community for for many many years, and uh, working on behalf of uh, regular workers. I mean, regular folks who who sometimes can't speak for themselves. Karen would step forward and help them. Uh, and, and I, I, my hats off to Karen. She's a wonderful person. But she gives you a great question. Have you been looking at this? The idea of having patch throughs and the ability to send out action alerts that might have a patch through for a particular legislative item. Who would who would like to pick that up? Would Would any of you guys to talk about that? Yeah, yeah. That. <laughs> so thank you. I, that is a that's a great great idea. Of course. So we are any ideas that we haven't fully implemented yet. We're jotting down any additional things, but we literally had a conversation about this yesterday. So <laughs> <laughs> your timing couldn't have been any, any better. So yeah, we are. We're looking into a bunch of avenues to get as much information out to the public and to those that may not be so politically astute or fully aware of what's going on. So yes, we are. And in addition, sorry. In addition- I was just gonna um, just say while, while well, I had Jabari. Uh, mm -hmm. I noticed that Jabari, you posted in the chat a, a PDF that says PrioritySchools.PDF. What is that? Yes. Yeah, so those are the schools I was mentioning that are, are on Brevard Public Schools priority list. They are not performing very well. So they're called the priority schools. So they're all listed there below, along with the principals and secretaries, if you want to volunteer specifically at those schools. Excellent. And, and I'm sorry to interrupt. Please excuse me. We're working on getting a newsletter. I mean, that some of our more astute volunteers who have done things like this many years before we started gave us some wonderful advice. And so we're working on something like membership levels, newsletters. It hasn't been completely sussed out. But yes, we do want to have some updated information go out there. And Kim, you had something to add as well. I was going to add that in addition um, to some of our outreach that we've done to other groups in, um, 
in the state. There is a group out of Sarasota that um, the lady who started it is a software developer. And she is graciously doing a lot of work for all groups in Florida um, that are battling these similar things. And so she's coming up with some amazing ideas too. So I was just thinking this is like a great thing to ask her to um, create for us so that we could just drop it into our pages. And, um, you know, we can battle these things like faster because she would be able to generate um, whatever we wanted really software wise. And um, so that was just something I had thought of while, while we were talking about it. Excellent. Our next question will be from Scott Tilley. Hey, good evening, everyone. Uh, my question has to do with um, volunteering. I apologize. I had to join the meeting a bit late because there was I was in a simultaneous meeting with another group. <laughs> Too much Zooming going on. Um, in particular, the question is actually to Jabari. Um, you were talking about you know these underperforming schools and the need for volunteers. I'm wondering if you can speak to what what form would this volunteerism take place? Like given my skill set, for example, what could I offer that these different schools might be in need of? Right, that's a good question. So I can't speak for every single school. Right now, the way uh, BPS is, they need volunteers for anything, everything from cafeteria to you name it, right? But um, there are particular programs. So one thing that we don't have, in, unfortunately, in Brevard Public Schools is a tutoring program or mentoring program that's the same across all schools. Uh, right now, it's kind of patchwork. Each school sort of has their own sort of system um, that may be changing in the future. Uh, so I would, that's why I wanted to post the actual PDF because the principal uh, and or secretary, secretary will be able to give you an exact place, but um, tutoring is one aspect, being reading, uh, working with uh, comprehension uh, during uh, school hours, you know, in the morning, all of these things are things that they, they would like to have. So hopefully, does that answer your question? If, uh, if, if I, I was going to, go ahead. Okay, oh, I was going to add um, something that I did as a mom um, when I would go into the classroom every week. Um, that requires, it, it doesn't require me to be a teacher, but it's really helpful with the reading aspect is um, I would work with the kids who um, were maybe a little bit behind or needed extra help. And I would just sit with them and we would read and I would ask them comprehension questions or the teacher would hand me a packet of things that um, they wanted me to work on with, like I would have five kids that I would see every week um, for whatever, 10 minutes at a time. And so the teachers have, most teachers have already done some of these things with parent helpers um, or other volunteers that uh, come in consistently, but also you could work in the media center where they don't have assistance anymore and just like helping kids check books out because there's one person in there now and it's the person watching all uh, an entire classroom and they might be working with one child trying to find a specific book and there's a line of kids who want to check out books. And so because they have limited time to an access to the library during their media days, even that is a helpful thing. And you can just say, I want to come in from whatever, 10 to 11 on Tuesday. And uh, they'll find a spot for you. Just one, one follow-up question, if I may, very brief. Yeah. Um, I think there was 22 schools that you listed at that were sort of at risk, I believe, 22 of them. Is any of the, are there schools broken down in terms of they need more science education, mathematics, reading, literacy, whatever it might be? Are the, is that data available so you know like specifically what each school is really, really in need of? I'm not sure that it breaks down in that fashion or that mm -hmm. specifically. Um, I think it's those schools are just in general under, they're not performing. Um, mm -hmm. And there's usually a lot of factors um, involved in that. But, um, I, and I think, honestly, I, it's probably like across the 
it's probably not just science or just mathematics. It's probably in, in a lot of subjects. So, um, but again, I really think like the, the principals really have a pulse on what's going on in their school. And if you have like a specific thing that you would enjoy teaching, like if you're really into science, um, you know, they might find, you might be able to find a perfect fit in one of those schools. All right. I'm sure if you, if, I'm sure if you just you called the school closest to you, they would find something within your interest. And it may uh, not necessarily you. be where you're working with students if you're not comfortable with that. As simple mm -hmm. as going into the library and putting the books back on the shelf so that the media center person can spend time with the students instead of doing that work. Uh, I went uh, in and made made signs for the science fair so the teacher didn't have to stay late one day and do it. Uh, mm -hmm. We have another woman who's sewing new tablecloths for the science fair tables um, so that we don't have to purchase them. Um, but even then, you're just, a, you're a face, you're a friendly face, and you're something familiar that the kids see and that they see that there's more leadership, there's more adults, there's more people in charge who are here taking care of us. Or well, maybe I'm a, I'm a retired professor, so students are not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe you're a management professional or you're good at organization. You can contact the principal and see if, if you can maybe organize the other volunteers who are doing this. There's 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 unlimited unlimited opportunities. All right. Thank you. I know that in our chat, the, the question has come up actually again, and that is so do we do you have an official position on the fact that they're they're trying to uh, eliminate school board salaries? I'll, I'll go if no one else wants to. Um, I think you can tell what a society values by how it pays, right? Um, I think a lot of positions around the country uh, don't pay, and that may be appropriate for them. If you're in a district that has four schools and you're spending two hours a week working on this, fine, you know, get volunteers to do that. That's appropriate. We are not in that district. We have, as Jabari said, 80 schools. These, these are 40 hour, at least 40 hour a week jobs, and they need to be compensated. Uh, plus you get into the issue where if you're not paying, then right off the bat, you've eliminated a sizable percent of the population who cannot do this work because they must be making a salary somewhere. So a lot of teachers, former teachers, people with experience in education will now be cut out of this job. And you're gonna end up with people who either can afford to not have a salary or um, just wanna volunteer and maybe aren't quite as qualified as someone you could have gotten if you were paying a salary. It's a terrible idea and it won't work well for Brevard. Do we know what uh, if that actually is a proposed bill and what the bill number is? Do we? I'm we know sorry, that? Phil. I just want to make sure that you're seeing DP might have some questions from I, Facebook. I do indeed. We're gonna we're gonna go to DP momentarily. Do we know what the bill number is uh, on this thing? If we don't, well, I'll tell you what. We're gonna watch that. Everybody should pay attention to that. Uh, DP uh, Willeman, he is uh, watching our uh, Facebook feed and uh, he may have a question himself. DP, what do you have for us? I actually have a few questions. Uh, they've been stacking up here. So give me a second to scroll through. The first one I have, I'm going to pin to the broadcast, is from Katie Delaney. This is a question for Kim. Discipline is the number one reason for teachers resigning. What will you do to ensure our teachers have support? Um, I, I agree. Discipline is a problem, uh, especially this year after mm -hmm. having um, children out of schools for um, like consistently for a couple of years. Um, I think that there's a really great policy on discipline from the district level. I've seen it. Um, I've discussed it with uh I forget her name, Jabari, do you remember? Anyway, I'll move on from that, but um, it's a great policy. I think that there is a very big disconnect between what is supposed to happen and what is actually happening per administration, per teacher. And so I think that it's really, really important that the administrators are supporting the teachers in the discipline policy. Um, and so I think that's really something that needs to be looked at um, district-wide in order to 
be sure that administrators are following those policies, that they are filling out the paperwork that needs to be filled out, that they are following up. And because once it gets, those papers are filled out and put through to, to the district, I've seen the way that that process goes after that. And I'm sorry, my cat is gonna try and make an appearance. <laughs> I'm blocking him. Um, and it's effective. Um, but I think that there is, I, I believe there's a disconnect between what the policy is and what is actually happening in the schools. And um, so I would say that the first thing that the school board needs to do or the district needs to do, not maybe necessarily the school board, is to be sure that those policies are in effect in the schools, that the principals understand what those policies are, which I believe they do, but that they're also following through on those policies. Um, my personal opinion, based on my teacher friends and the people who are in the schools um, volunteering from a parent perspective, is that there is so much disciplinary problems in a way that they haven't experienced before that every kid can't go to the, to the office because there's no place to put a child in the office because there's so many children that need to go to the office. And, and this is from speaking literally just the other day to a friend who was um, substituting in my child's class. Um, there are problems and uh, it's disrespect. It's not treating substitutes with respect either. Um, it's coming from <clears throat> children that normally have never had problems before. Um, and so I, I also believe that as a community, this is another thing like we as parents in a community need to come in and support our teachers and our administrators by um, being sure that, I mean, I, I feel like most parents who are this involved where we're at right now, and Katie, I know that you are an involved parent, um, we need to also instill those things in our children. And, you know, maybe I, I know that like my daughter is in a place where she'll say that that child was, that boy was not doing what he was supposed to do. So sometimes you're just modeling that behavior for other kids is a good example from our own children. But um, Kim, if you've been in a classroom, it's chaos. Kim, I hate to cut you off, but we're now racing against the clock. I know we've got several more questions and hopefully we'll get... Uh... Yes, I'm going to pass a, a couple more from Facebook Please. here. I have uh, Fallon Gresham. This is for you, Kim. How do you plan to keep school board meetings a welcoming space for everyone, regardless of their background or beliefs? I mean, I feel that there's only so much that our school district or that our school board members can and are capable of doing to keep that environment where it's welcoming to everyone. Um, the last two years have been just insane. Like I, most of the people from our group do not feel safe indoors with um, a room full of people not masked and not vaccinated. A lot of the people in our group have um, serious health um, issues that they, they cannot be exposed to COVID. Um, and so I, I think, I mean, short of not allowing people into the boardroom, I really don't know how you can make it more welcoming. There, there are officers in the room. I have never felt like I was going to be in danger. Um, physically at a school board meeting, I, I feel like they can be a little, they feel oppressive um, in terms of the energy. Um, but I, I think our school board is doing a, a good job within the limitations that they have within the rules of COVID. Um, beyond COVID, I think um, it just is a matter of keeping like some sort of like uh, order in the boardroom, and that's really up to the people who are in charge of running the meeting. Back to you. Thank Dean. you. Thank you. I've got uh, one here from Sarah Mursky. This might be a tough one, but it's addressed to all of you. How does Families for Safe Schools plan on engaging the scientists who disagree with the Families for Safe Schools scientific consensus 
especially those who have published peer-reviewed scientific studies on contamination. Cheryl. Well, I mean, we have to go, so let's, let's go to climate change. Something like 97% of all peer-reviewed scientific studies agree that climate change is due to human activity. There are 3% of publications that are ambiguous or they say something contrary to that. And I would encourage people to look at the majority. So when Michelle was mentioning the CDC, the AMA, American Academy of Pediatrics, these are people who have come together. They are thousands of people, hundreds of hours for each of them studying what they do. And I would encourage the, the dissenting scientists and the community to look at the overriding consensus of all these minds that have come together to put these formulations together. And I realize some of them are not perfect. This is a really crazy virus and we are learning more about it every single day. It has an extremely high mutation rate. People are testing masks. Um, the way people wear masks is, is different. So it's very difficult to have one standard of, um, of a prescription, but the generalities we all agree on that we're, <laughs> I'm a big fan of Dr. Fauci, but we, we have him, we have the entire CDC, the AMA, and huge, huge conglomerations of professionals who all are saying the same thing. And I would encourage, like I said, both the dissenters and the community to look at the consensus opinion because your peer review science, that has been around since the 1600s. It's not perfect, but it's the best that we have. And I wanna encourage people to just to, to go with that. And I mean, and to keep up with it because it does change every day. And it is going to take uh, a little bit of trust and a little bit of faith in our professionals because we learn more each day. We're down to the last few minutes. I see. And I have just one more. Um, okay. This comment is from Kendra Schumer. What is Families for Safe Schools position on BPS choice schools? Can you answer in 30 seconds, guys? So there's no position on, on that that you could do in 30 seconds? In 30 okay, seconds, our, no. Our position is that there's nothing wrong with choice schools. I mean, I, I believe that's our position. There's we are not against choice schools. If we could, all we would love to have schools. every school be a choice <laughs> school. Excellent. And I'm going to go right up to Riot Al Shaibi. You have a question. You've been waiting this, this whole time. Go ahead. No, I'm, I'm just trying to also listen to everybody. I, I, I want to make sure everybody gets the chance outside. I'm trying to move the questions quickly and answers, but we have, we're, we're enjoying every answers, and I appreciate all of you. I'll end it with this, Space Coast Progressive, of course, they look for action locally. And the, the, the big elephant in the room is the district, I feel, because a lot of things come from, 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 from the school board and from, from, uh, from the district itself in Dubar County. And Cheryl, you, you said something about shifting away from negativity. And the other side, or the people who have a different opinion probably look at us as, as we're negative too, or not me, my, this, these positions, we agree or disagree. So. We need to, and I, I like your answer about cons the consensus. You have, everybody needs to look at what everybody's thinking about. The other, the, the, other, the question that I, I do want to ask is, the, uh, Jabari mentioned something about equity audit. Uh, and, and I know we're working with Dr. McKinnon. Personally, I'm working, I'm going to miss a good meeting next Friday. But a, an equity audit, and what are the challenges that are happening that you guys so dealing with the district. We have two minutes until the program ends, so we'll have to do this. Is, is this a challenge, uh, the challenges of getting the equity audit or? The, the challenge is that the, the equity audit can be done correctly with, with the environment and the way the district is running with negativity from both sides. I'm not going to blame one or the other. Right, how, right. How is politics in, is going to affect these kind of beautiful things like an equity audit going on in, in this in this uh, in this uh, county. Well, that that's the unknown, right? With these bills. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to preemptively take action before anything can negatively uh, impact these sort of things like an equity audit. Um, it goes through something like that would require board approval, but prior to that, there's an entire process that would have to go through bidding, procurement, 
in the policies and procedures of of uh, reaching out to specific vendors and going through that process. Dr. McKinnon has an entire process laid out. Um, she uh, is, is uh, attempting to go through that process now, but with these bills, that is a, a big issue. We don't want things like this, uh, these bills like Stop Woke to prevent actions that help our students. So we're trying to get ahead of it, ahead of any of these before they would negatively impact our students. We have a couple of great comments that are in the chat. I'm afraid I don't have time to go through them, but uh, hopefully those that have been on the Zoom meeting can look at those comments. A great one from Fran Bear, uh, a great one from uh, Deb Clark. Uh, and as I understand it, we're talking about uh, action items. So very quickly, you've said uh, you're, you're uh, inter interested in pushing back against uh, several different bills. Uh, you'd like everybody to take an, an hour uh, a month if they can on mentoring or being a registered volunteer. Uh, go to school board meetings and and uh, let your voice be heard and stand up with uh, Families for Safe Schools. Any other action items? We have literally uh, 30 seconds left. What do you have, guys? Be an ally to teachers. Support your teachers. Support your teachers. An excellent, mm -hmm. an excellent thought. We have heard so much tonight. We have heard so many terrific ideas. Again, to join Families for Safe Schools, we go to your Facebook page uh, and you can log on and we'll be watching for uh, an update here on your website. Can you tell us what the website address is? I put it in the chat a while ago, but... Um... It's, it's uh, familiesforsafeschools.com. Thank you. Very simple, familiesforstateschools.com. My thanks to everybody. I appreciate everybody that has joined us here on our Zoom meeting, everybody that has joined us on Facebook Live. Uh, we hope to see you uh, in, for months and years to come. You, this is a tremendous, tremendous effort and a tremendous group of people. Thanks so we've everybody. taken everybody off of mute so they can clap. Thank you. I think <laughs> if, we were, if you were in a live meeting, we would all be giving you a great round of applause. You deserve a standing ovation. Uh, our next meeting for the Space Coast Progressive Alliance will be uh, Thursday, April 7th. Uh, and so everybody make a note of that, our, our uh, uh, next event, Thursday, April 7th. Thanks to all of you. Have a wonderful night. Nice, please, please be safe and, and please be courteous to each other. We all deserve uh, uh, the respect of other people and we, we should give other people respect to hear their opinions as well. Have a beautiful night, everybody. Be safe. Thank See you. you later. Thank, Thank you, you everyone. And for those, for those that are on our uh, action projects committee, please stay 